Welcome to CISO's Insiders Podcast, powered by GRC Consulting. In this podcast, we'll be interviewing leading CISOs and security leaders in the industry for light, eye-level conversations. Here, they share advice and tips, talk about their biggest accomplishments and failures, favorite drinks, key influencers, and much more. We encourage you to walk away with at least one insight that will help you better yourself or your business. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more content, please check us out on social media. Good morning, everybody. Today I'm speaking with Jack Freund. Uh, by the way, did I pronounce this correctly? Your last yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, going uh, over your bio, I see that you start off as a system engineer uh, in the auto insurance uh, industry. And then you moved uh, to, uh, you know, to the cybersecurity world uh, back in 2007, I think maybe before that. And, you know, you progressed, you held a, a few uh, positions as uh, uh, in, in the risk management space and then cybersecurity architecture, consultant, senior manager, director. Uh, I know that you've been involved with creating a framework that's called FAIR and I think you're last position was uh, that, that you're currently the VP and head of cyber security, cyber risk and methodology over at BitSight. But uh, having, you know, having said all that, maybe you can step in, introduce yourself properly. Well, thank you so much, Ben. And uh, yeah, I've uh, had an interesting career, um, very passionate about telecommunications when um, I first started out and then 9-11 happened and we started to switch the way that we thought about things, uh, especially while I was working for Lucent Technologies. Um, there was a lot of uh, security concerns we started to design into our product set. So uh, that sort of, you know, lit the spark and made me very interested in security. Uh, back then it was just IT security and now, of course, we call everything cyber. Uh, so, yeah, and that, that sort of launched this uh, whole other path where I tried to help organizations better understand uh, out of all the cybersecurity things you could do, well, what are the ones that are the most impactful? And that's really what led me down the risk management path. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing cyber risk quantification now for 12, 15 years or so. And um, it's uh, been really a, a very strong passion of mine ever since. Thank you for that introduction, Jack. Um, and, uh, you know, so to be honest, we met face to face uh, at RSA conference a few months ago, and we had this uh, nice conversation. And we and we decided we'll, we should uh, be doing one of these episodes, and potentially we should also be doing a special edition of the episode, specifically talking about risk quantification there. Um, so definitely, I'll be more than happy to have you here again in the near future. Uh, and this specific episode today, we'll be talking mostly about you and your journey. And the intent is to uh, educate our listeners and you know provide them with tools uh, that would uh, potentially help them progress their career in the cybersecurity field. Uh, I always like to start off with a couple of uh, questions before we dive right in. Uh, can you share your marital status and your favorite drink? Yeah, sure. Uh, yep, I'm married and um, I don't, uh, I don't really drink alcohol anymore, so I would have to say my favorite drink is probably Diet Pepsi at this point. <laughs> That's so boring. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and, and I have to say, not too tasty. I, I mean, uh, for me, I... Uh, <laughs> you don't like that kind? <laughs> I, I, don't like, I don't like Pepsi. I like Coke, but like whenever I try Pepsi, it just like, it doesn't, I don't know, yeah. it doesn't taste right to me. But uh, I drink anyway. a lot of Coke Zero too, so, uh, you know. Yeah. Didn't they forbid it, like ban it in the U.S.? I heard something like that. Oh, well, I don't know this for sure. And far <laughs> be it for me to disparage another brand. But uh, I do think the history of Coca-Cola back when there were a lot of tonics and stuff in the U.S., I think they did actually put cocaine in it. I think that's where it sort of came from. Mm. Uh, you know, just, just like they used to put radium in, you know, tinctures to, you know, help cure all that, that kind of stuff. Like that was a, that was a, a, a that was yeah. far before the FDA stepped in and said, listen, we can't do stuff like this. Yeah, that was like in the 1700s, right? When they sold it originally as medicine. Something like that, yeah. 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 I mean, listen, I, I got, I'm got. i not going to lie. I'd be a lot more peppy if I was, you know, drinking uh, cocaine every day too. So yeah. well, I can see I mean, why they did it. I mean, forget about cocaine, but uh, just Coke, like, like Coca-Cola. If I could, I would drink it all day, every day. It's like probably my favorite drink, oh, like the, yeah. the non-alcoholic 
my favorite, you know. Fair, um, fair well, you know, let's dive right in. If there's one one thing you wish you'd known before you begin your career, what would that be? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, when I think back to where I was in the beginning, I was just so anxious to get into the field and uh, begin you know, being useful to somebody. And um, I, throughout everything, I've definitely had this very frantic pace of trying to do too much too soon. So I think perhaps the best advice, uh, you know, uh, young Jack would, or sorry, old Jack would give young Jack, I was bald back then too, so I can't say that, but uh, was just to sort of slow down and, and you know, be willing to enjoy uh, where I was at the time. Uh, but maybe that's a thing that all people think about when they get older is, you know, I, I wish I would have enjoyed where I was at the time more often. Mm, you all, I, I think you tapped into something here. I think uh, I would dare say that, uh, you know, a much broader uh, issue globally mm -hmm. than just that. But uh, thank you. Um, you know, and looking back at your career, can you pinpoint like a single or a, a few single, uh, a few biggest failures and maybe, you know, outline what did you learn from them? I got fired a couple of times. Um, I just uh, wasn't... Um, where I needed to be professionally, you know, and these sort of things happen. So I think that's one, something that, that's always a good, um, you know, everyone's the star of their own story, right? So when you write a resume, when you write a bio, you don't include all the times you were fired <laughs> in there or you were like, oh, or, uh, and I think that's something that, um, especially for people that are starting out in their careers, they should better understand that, uh, you know, even, you know, w when you read bios, you read the successes, you don't necessarily read the fact that people struggled to get where they were. They had the sort of, understand you know corporate environments and sometimes they made missteps or aligned themselves with you know the, the wrong political forces inside of an organization and sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't and i think that's a so yeah i mean i you know i look back on those things and i feel shame and guilt over them but the reality is i think everybody you know suffers through those types of things as they move through their career Mm -hmm. and, and do you think those, uh, these specific ex experiences when you got fired, do you think uh, they, they taught you something specific? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you would have to be a sociopath not to <laughs> learn something from getting, from getting fired or getting let go. And, and in each of those times, it's so, so cliche and you see it all over LinkedIn and everywhere else. But um, the reality is every time that that happened, I did go on to something much better. And I was, uh, I was very glad for that because I don't know that I would have purposely made that change in my life, but for having to have been forced to do that. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's one of the things, again, that goes back to what we said at first week. If you don't think about um, where you are at the time, you know, you feel a little frantic about getting to the next thing. But uh, for sure, you know, those things helped out a lot as I progressed in my career. Okay. I'm just trying to unpack this a bit more and understand what did you learn from that? Like, what was your key oh. takeaway from, you know, getting fired, for example? Oh, well, I mean, if I think about just like the very early ones, it was just sort of better understanding time management and how PTO worked and just stupid things like that. that uh, you know, as, as, a, as a kid, I didn't quite wrap my head around, um, uh, you know, like I was, I, uh, we had done a major IT, um, uh, implementation, uh, and it was over um, the New Year's holiday, and I didn't come in uh, on the Sunday to check on stuff because it was Sunday. It was literally New Year's Day, and I should have come in, and uh, that didn't go well because nobody was able to get access to their things on that Monday. So, you know, just stuff like that, just really sort of basic, stupid, um, here's how you work in a corporate environment kind of stuff that uh, I failed at. Wish I didn't, but I did. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, speaking about those uh, failures, what would you say your biggest accomplishment was? Gosh, you know, I, I, I'm very proud of the work that I've done um, on the FAIR standard, uh, co-authoring that book with Jack Jones. You know, I mean, that was, that was huge for me. And um, it's, uh, so I, I, that really has to be it. But, you know, I think the bigger accomplishment that sort of underpinned that was being willing to meet people like uh, my co-author Jack, and then also being willing to um, suggest projects and work hard at them. Like these things don't just sort of fall on your lap. You have to sort of make them happen. And uh, so, yeah, I was really proud of that. And 
um, you know, the, the book won an award, people talk about it all the time, people recognize me. And that's a, that's an odd thing for somebody in our, in our business to, you know, come close up, but people call me famous. I don't really feel that. I don't know what famous is supposed to feel like, but people recognize me and that's, that's always a good feeling. So, um, you know, I, I think I'll live the rest of my life trying to live up to those expectations, but, uh, I won't, um, I won't regret them ever. Well, I definitely like the humility, but just to, you know, to, to set this in context, uh, as far as I know, FAIR is one of the most recognizable uh, frameworks out there for quantifying risk uh, in the risk management space. So, you know, definitely, I mean, uh, standing on the side, and I definitely, I'm definitely thinking this, this is an achievement. You know, I, I first heard about FAIR, I think back at 2010, when it just, you know, I think it was very early on back then. But yeah, I think by now it's become, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, I, well, I think I, I think I am sure. I think it's become like an industry best practice for quantifying risk, right? That organizations out there uh, um, like employ it and use it as a framework. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of companies are either uh, using products that implement FAIR um, in their risk management program or they uh, build their own programs that... Well, leverage the open fair standard or something like that. So yeah, for sure. That's something that people are familiar with. Yeah. They're trying to work through and, uh, you know, I'm still trying to refine it and make it more useful for people, um, in 2022, as it was for people, you know, back when we were, you know, working on it in the early 2000s. Yeah, definitely, you know, uh, an achievement in my opinion and, and kudos about that. Um, you know, moving on, uh, you know, looking at the industry right now and you can looking at the young professionals, what advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting space because there are an interesting space to work in. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people say this. When we started, you know, there were no cybersecurity careers. Again, nothing was called cyber. It was mostly network engineering where you got into security if you got into it all. Um, so it was useful back then to have uh, a reference discipline. So I was good at this and then I could apply that in the security space. So I was good at telecommunications and computer networking and I was applying you know, security things to that. Uh, now you can go to school and specialize in cybersecurity. And I think that's valuable um, for sure. I, you know, I think the landscape for those kind of skill sets is different now than it was back then. So again, you can just hire cybersecurity professionals, but we're all trying to do that in this space. So um, having that sort of, you know, reference discipline, I think is still valuable, but not just in IT. I worked in accounting, for example. So then, you know, this is uh, something that, you know, we can leverage in um, security, I, I, you know, or, um, or marketing or uh, communications of some kind. I think people are a lot more open to that than they used to be. And there's a lot less, you um, uh, gatekeeping uh, I think now than there used to be and I think that's an important thing for people to understand too that whatever skill sets you you bring you know, working in accounting working in communications or marketing or um, you know I, I like to hire people you know one person who works for me now uh, was a psychometrician and, and now she's working in cybersecurity. there's a lot of transferable skills there for sure so mm -hmm. um, I, I think the the advice I'd give is you know be open to um, new opportunities and understanding how the things that you've done can translate into the cybersecurity space, especially when it comes to communication and helping people understand technical things. There is, in my opinion, not going to be um, uh, a skill that's going to be more valuable in cybersecurity than that for, for a long time to come. Got it. And, and you know, when let's say I'm a young professional and I'm just, and I'm just starting off my career right now, there's so many like avenues I can I can choose, right? There's so many places I can start my career at. Like I could be a SOC 2 analyst. I could go into penetration testing. I could do SDLC. I can do GRC. I could do so many things. Like in your opinion, like how can one, you know, find out what they want to do, what they should do? Yeah, I think you need to try those things uh, either through, and this is where, the educational landscape has shifted substantially too. You know, again, the 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 funnel of new people into security used to be very narrow. Um, you know, mostly network engineering, uh, maybe some programming. Now we'll take all sorts. So, 
Um, but the the way for you to learn and gain those skills has shifted substantially too. So not, not just through, you know, the industry organizations like ISACA or ISSA, um, you can learn a lot about different types of security careers that way. Uh, but you can go on, you know, organizations like, uh, you know, edX or Coursera and just sort of take free courses to better understand, gee, you know, what does a pen tester do? That sounds fun. What I like to do that. Um, side note, most of the job is actually really writing reports and not actually doing really cool movie hacker stuff. You know, so learning about those kind of things is important. So you understand mm -hmm. what the job is actually going to be like. Um, I was listening to some podcast talking about something entirely different, but they were sort of joking that, you know, there's, they thought that there were a lot of lawyers that went to school to be a lawyer that don't actually do any law work on this side of that degree. Um, you know, my wife, who's a CPA, will joke that the CPA acronym stands for can't pass again. And you don't actually want to do any of those things that you learn how to do as a CPA after. You know, I, I think, um, I don't think that's how security works. I think people that like it continue to do those kind of things. But um, I wonder if that distinction, and I'm just speculating here, I wonder if that distinction has to be more with the fact that you get to experience what those careers look like before you get those credentials and security a little bit more. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, I, it's something to think about too, is that I think there's opportunities to try versions of these different things through, you know, online programs and stuff and be like, yeah, I think this is something I'm really into. Um, because honestly, the field of security is much broader now than it used to be. And all the things that you can do in it are much uh, more varied. So learning what it's like to, um, to, you know, to live a day in the life of those kind of careers, I think is really important to help you narrow down the things you want to do. Yeah, and you have to remember also that it keeps evolving all the time. Nonstop, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and you know, my following question is interesting uh, for me to ask you in particular. Uh, so as, as you know, like there are many organizations out there that, you know, the, the, the CSER role is actually part of the IT organization. Do you have any specific thoughts about that? Like what are the pros and cons or any thoughts whatsoever? Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of like the official answer that everybody is supposed to give, which is, you know, sees that Roche would be outside of the IT organization. Um, to me, I think the, 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 the real answer sort of lies in personalities and, and you know, the, the people who hold these roles, what they expect out of them and how well they are at communicating with their peers and their superiors that way because you know fundamentally it's difficult i think let's just assume a CISO reports to a cio your job would be to have an entire team of people who is to uh, be a check on all of your peers all day long all i'm doing is you know looking at your work ben and making sure that you're doing it right um that creates a little bit of you know friction between us uh, so it really depends on how our personalities are and how we're able to interact um you know i've been privileged to see people in those roles that really know how to do it well that collaborate that uh, really sort of have this business mindset to say you know regardless of where i report i can accomplish the things i need to accomplish because of uh, how i am and the uh you know uh, how i show up to this job um so i think that's really important um you know if you're looking for you know, a more uh, official three lines of defense model, then you have to sort of think about maybe the season role reports outside of uh, the IT role because you're doing a lot more checks and balances that way. It's always it's always complicated because in any season organization, you have teams that are uh, performing uh, and, and operating controls as well as checking the controls and like the IT risk function or the cyber security function, um, um, particular to cyber risk. So those things need to be considered as well. But uh, you know, I think that role has shifted a lot uh, over, you know, the decade or more. And I think now um, with there being a lot more focus on you know, business priorities and sort of rationalizing controls in the context of the things we're trying to accomplish as an organization, um, the, the skill sets have shifted a lot too. And I think the requirement now for CISOs that have better um, negotiating skills, better you know, business acumen, I, I think are, are much higher. So with the right person, I'll sum this up, uh, with, the night, with the right person, with the right you know, soft skills, I, I think um, they could succeed regardless of the reporting structure. But um, a lot of uh, external forces are sort of valuing that a little bit differently. And that reporting structure, you know, probably going to be fluid over the next couple of years as it shifts. Okay, thank you.
And when we started this episode, uh, you know, we you mentioned that you started off as an engineer and then you transitioned into the cybersecurity world. So I'm assuming there was a, a lot of um, like uh, like learning associated with that, probably self learning as well as maybe industry certifications and and formal training as well. Can you name or you know just outline what were the best resources that have helped you to get to where you are? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, again, I was working in the telecommunications industry at Lucent Technologies, a company that doesn't exist anymore. They're now part of Ericsson, I think. Um, and it, it all of a sudden became really important that we start putting cybersecurity things uh, into all of our product sets. Um, so I found myself um, with an opportunity to join these working groups where we were evaluating uh, what they're called feature description documents or FDDs. These, you know, here's a new feature we want to add around public key um, infrastructure on these different uh, cell site equipments. Um, so I, I, you know, used that opportunity to sort of throw myself into it and learn more about it. Uh, it was it was shallow. It was very narrowly focused on just this one piece of it and, and my role in the greater um, product set that way. But I wanted. I wanted more and I thought it was going to be valuable going forward. Um, so, you know, I found myself um, through a couple different industry groups, uh, later IEEE, ISSA, and I just sort of met people um, that were doing these types of things. And uh, eventually one of them gave me an opportunity to come work for them, you know, doing security stuff broadly. But, um, you know, I, I, I sort of used the opportunities that I could in the role that I was in. And then later, um, you know, spent a lot of time just sort of reading books and learning about it. Uh, and, and that um, gave way eventually to, you know, earning um, a CISP credential and those kind of things, which I think are important to cap off experiences, but um, you know, they don't necessarily, I mean, you have to learn things in order to take those exams, but I think it's better to um, spend some time um, in a role, doing a job, and then supplementing it with some um, some uh, learning about the theoretical constructs and those kind of things, I think, go together very well. Anyway, so I, I think basically it was sort of like I had an opportunity in my current role to learn something about it, and then I, that opened the door enough for me to want to learn and read and ask more questions and uh, eventually grow into that much more fully. Got it. So it started off with like, you know, um, you networking, it led to on the, job, on the job training, and that opened you up to like a, a whole world of, uh, you know, information, and then you just uh, self-learned your way through. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, the role that I had um, as the engineer was sort of around testing features um, and designing automated tests for these types of things. So, you know, my role is fairly limited, but um, I was around people that knew it very deeply and very well, and I just began reading the documents that they they were producing and listening in on these, you know, weekly status meeting calls and stuff they're working on and why and you know, all these Googling terms I didn't understand later. Um, and, you know, I think that's 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 a way I think that you leverage um, stuff you're currently in to be able to learn more about this later. Just you know, ask questions offline, send emails, and then you know, kind of those kind of things to better understand. You know, again, in the scope that you're responsible for, I know what I'm doing, and then expanding that to um, the broader theoretical, theoretical constructs, I think was um, very helpful for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there one common myth about uh, this profession that you wanted to debunk? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I sometimes ask people that like, um, that are in the medical profession, like, you know, when you're watching medical dramas, like, can you, can you really enjoy them or you spend all this time, you know, demand, like, oh, this is, this is wrong. We would never do that. Uh, I, I think uh, that's an important consideration for cybersecurity as well. Like, it seems like a really, uh, you know, uh, you know, fun all the time kind of job. And I, I hinted at this earlier that, you know, a, a lot of us writing reports. <laughs> so I think that's, that's part of it. There are some, you know, some adrenaline filled moments, especially if you're, you know, working as a pen tester or in, in incident response, but um, it's, you know, like any job, it's surprisingly mundane um, from time to time too. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think if you ask like a firefighter, the same thing, like they're rushing into a, a building when it's on fire, like I'm sure that's awfully uh, exciting. And then, you know, the rest of the time they're making chili and just working out like it's, it's you know, so I, I think, I think any job has its, has its downtime. And uh, I think it's important for people to remember that, you know, in cybersecurity, we also have downtime too. 
Yeah. And, you know, just to debunk uh, one more thing, uh, as opposed to what you see on, on, on television and, and in the movies, it typically takes more than five seconds to hack the Pentagon. Yeah, it's like seven or eight, but yeah. I'm yeah, right, right. <laughs> typically. <laughs> and, and for sure, the operating systems that, uh, you know, cybersecurity professionals use are pretty right. much the same operating systems that you guys use. So right. it's not all graphical and showing you all kinds yeah. of uh, cool stuff. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, uh, in your opinion, I, mean, I imagine it must be difficult to be a screenwriter and trying to make, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, report writing for cybersecurity look really exciting on screen. Yeah. So I'll give them a little bit of, you know, a, yeah. a little bit of disbelief to make that exciting. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Uh, in your opinion, what are the main concerns that CISOs nowadays have? Yeah, I mean, I think after, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we, we shifted very, I think, in, you know, that was unfortunate, but I think we, it caused us to shift in a good direction, which is it has um, aligned security teams broadly to the business even more than they were before uh, because of the business continuity aspects of this and, and concerns around ransomware in particular and business interruption broadly. Uh, are directly tied to organizations' abilities to execute on their goals and objectives. So, so this is sort of taking it from, uh, you know, focus, probably an over-focus on um, confidentiality concerns and data breach concerns, much more squarely now to, oh, now we can actually do any of our jobs now. Or, you know, now that we have moved from a company with one office with all our employees in one location, uh, now we've moved to, we have employees all over the place with lots of remote access and how, how do we secure that and how do we make sure that we can continue to operate that way. So I think it's it's forced CISOs, it's forced security teams to be much uh, more strongly aligned to business objectives and to, uh, and to help be able to ensure organizations can execute against them. Okay, thank you. And in your opinion then, what specific areas should CISOs should be like more focused on right now and going forward as well? Yeah, I think strategy is a big one. Uh, and I think that really ties back to um, the business interruption concerns. Like, you know, how, how do I ensure that, you know, in anything that I'm doing, whether I'm building out new IAM programs or, uh, you know, strengthening my SOC and incident response teams, you know, how do I ensure that um, the, the strategy for that is aligned with where the business is going? and uh, how we can stay connected to that. And, and that's, that's sort of a broad umbrella term for a lot of things, but uh, I, I can't help but think that, you know, if you're coming to that role with a predefined set of, you know, these are the 10 things I did in my last role, I'm gonna do those same 10 things here. I think it's, um, you know, that's helpful, but I think at the same time, you have to sort of tailor those things to how is this organization operating? How does cash flow through the organization so that I can better understand where concerns are and uh, where we can have risk? And I think that's 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 the key thing, uh, I think, is mm -hmm. you know, better aligning the different controls that an organization needs to either implement or improve to, um, to, to, to uh, uh, business opportunities that allow those things to flourish. Let's try to unpack this just a bit more, if that's okay. Uh, and, you know, we've discussed the transition of IT security to cybersecurity. And, you know, cybersecurity is an all-encompassing term that, you know, includes uh, application security as well as, uh, you know, penetration testing, as well as governance, risk, and compliance, and, and everything else. Uh, and I know you've mentioned strategy. This is, you know, one of the things, one of the areas that CISO should be focused on right now. It, and I know you also mentioned the soft skills and the importance of soft skills for, for CISOs to have. What are, like, are there any other important skills that CISOs nowadays should have? And considering, like, the industry and considering where this role is going. Yeah. They, they, um, Attracting talent is, is going to be a big one. Um, that's a key part of how to um, build out and execute against any program. So I think that's one of them. And that's that's a unique um, take, I suppose. So thinking about you know, not just how does how does the HR function help me fill roles, but you know, how do I leverage how do I leverage new talent in my organization? How do I leverage the talent that I inherit? In any organization, 
more than half of your team is not going to be selected by you. So you have to better understand how do I um, motivate people to be able to to accomplish the goals and objectives that I have. So I think I think I think that's a big one. Um, and I think uh, another skill set that's really valuable is um, um, understanding the business side of security. And, and this is sort of looking at things like, you know, budgeting and finance and understanding, you know, how, uh, how, uh, how budgeting works in an organization. So I think those sort of like uh, you know, chief of staff type of things are really, really critical to be able to execute against these goals. And, you know, so I think about some of the work um, that we're doing around, you know, security maturity and some of the ways that we're scoring that. And you know, some of the things I'm looking at are, you know, how, from a strategy perspective, have you have you built out budgets for multiple years, for, you know, and and has organizations decided to fund those for multiple years? I think that's an important skill set. That, that to be able to do that means you're not just we're looking at, um, uh, you know, at a, at a rolling twelve months of things that I can do, but you're sort of looking at broader programmatic shifts, saying, you know, I need to um, build an an IAM team, or I need to take this team from uh, one of my CIO peers, integrate it into my team, and then spin it back out again. Like those type of things take a long time. And that requires a better understanding of not just upfront costs, but operating tail um, and better understanding the way that th th those budgets work. So I think, I think that's another skill set too, is effectively um, corporate finance, I think is, is a critical skill set that uh, uh, CISOs need or they need to you know, supplement um, to the skill sets they currently have. Okay, and looking at you know the CISO role, like you know five years from now, you think we'll see pretty much more in the more of the same, or will this role evolve further? In your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand f finance is kind of a boring thing <laughs> for a, a CISO to want to learn, but you know, I, I would expect that you're going to see um, you know more CISOs with MBAs um, that and 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 business degrees than sees those with computer science degrees. I think it's true today. I think it's going to even, even be more prevalent in the future. It's, it's going to be more and more um, a business role and less and less uh, a security role. Um, now, I don't know what that means necessarily for um, the, uh, the, the highly talented security person. You know, is it, is it always going to be that they come up through security and then shift over with some business skills and then become CISO. I don't, I don't know if that's how it's going to be or if it's going to be that, you know, this is another role um, through which, you know, uh, one of the, you know, IT business leads has an opportunity to take, to learn and more expand their role too. So I, I think, you know, for people that are reporting to CISOs, I think understanding that, you know, that pathway is going to be different um, in the future. And it may not be the pathway that you want to go down either. I think we spent a lot of time in the past 10 years or so with um, security practitioners saying, you know, eventually I want to be CISO. I think as these roles mature in organizations, people should reconsider, is that a thing I really want to do? Or do I want to be, you know, a technical expert and spend more time doing that? Or do I want to be a risk expert and move into a chief risk officer role? Um, mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, a business transformation role. I think there's going to be a lot more subtle opportunities for that pathway over the coming years. But I don't know that I can predict you know, how that's going to be, but I would expect more, more business and less tech skills in the future. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, in your opinion, what will we see in the cybersecurity world next? I mean, I think, I think we're seeing a lot of shifts in automation right now. Uh, I think that's going to continue to happen. Um, you know, there's only so many uh, economic levers that can be pulled. You know, we could never, you know, I, I say this a lot, but in some of my prior roles, you know, there was only so many people that I could hire to push buttons to do stuff. At a certain point, you have to start developing software to be able to automate a lot of these routine kind of roles. And I think that's going to continue. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more with, um, you know, machine learning algorithms to help automate a lot of those things. I think that's going to continue. Um, you know, I, I have a unique perspective on that because in my early days, I mentioned prior about being an engineer it was in a factory. It was a factory that made high-tech telecommunications equipment, but it was still a factory. So you started thinking about automation from the very beginning. 
and how any job could be automated with the right, you know, programming and the right equipment. And, and I think about that a lot today with, you know, the stuff that we're, um, the stuff that we're spending uh, staff resources on to be able to develop and to do things. Um, I always sort of wonder at a certain point, you know, when is this no longer a job and when is there somebody that's, you know, taking the outputs of that job and then delivering it. So um, as much as, and as important as it is to learn technical skills, that's where I think things like soft skills are a real hedge against the future that way, because regardless of what happens, you still have to have somebody that knows how to interpret these things, communicate them, to write those reports and then be able to tell people what's important and communicate with them, with them that way. So I, you know, I, I think we're going to see more of the same in the future. I think it's just mm -hmm. going to be much more focused and much more ubiquitous. Okay. And, you know, uh, a follow-up question to that, what would you define as innovation in our space? So obviously, you know, uh, like before and after FAIR. So FAIR was definitely an innovation, like the framework that you helped uh, create in, in helping organization quantify risk. But like nowadays, what, what would you define as innovation in this space? Yeah, I mean, I, I like that definition that says that, uh, you know, any highly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, <laughs> I guess we said that, but, uh, you know, I, th I think that's really what, what innovation looks like is, you know, when we have these, um, these problems that um, we don't have to think about anymore. Um, you know, asset inventory is a huge problem, very boring, you know, just sort of making sure we know where all the servers and all the databases are, um, very, very boring problem. But uh, any sort of, like true innovation would be, I mean, that's number one and number two on the CIS list for a reason, because nobody really does it very well. Um, so finding strong innovation around those kind of things would make them, automatable in such a way that it seems like magic. Like, oh, I have this list of assets. I know where they all are. I'm not surprised anymore. I know what all my IP assets are and I'm not surprised anymore when I find one. And um, if I, if one does pop up, it becomes, you know, something I need to in investigate that, you know, where did this come from? Um, so I, I think that's really, and that's a sort of a, a very high level definition, but I think, I think the sort of routine problems, um, asset inventory comes to mind um, yeah, sorting through, uh, you know, any sort of alerts like that, where we're able to sort of surface the things that really require, um, action from people that can apply things that people are really good at doing, um, as opposed to just sort of, you know, routinely clicking through things and better understanding them that way. I, I think, I think that opportunity to do that is, uh, is where real innovation comes from. Thank you. Uh, and we're almost at the tail end of our episode today. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions uh, more before I let you go. Uh, you know, talking a bit about okay. <laughs> talking a bit about vendors, mm -hmm. what is it that you think vendors should not be doing nowadays? Well, I work for a vendor now, so I have a very different perspective on that. But, uh, you know, I think... Um, you have to be careful that you're selling um, that, that that you're not selling magic. Like you, you have to sort of better be willing to understand and to articulate. This is what we can't do for you. Um, and, and I've um, been privileged to be around some really talented salespeople that are very good at saying, "We can't help you with that. This is what we're good at." Um, I think it's uh, difficult for you know salespeople want to sell. They want to be able to help customers. And um, from a product perspective, sometimes I think, well, there's a lot of stuff we could do. We're not doing that right now. So I have to better understand exactly the things that, um, you know, we can help people with and then, you know, trust that there's a, a roadmap to get there to the things I think we, we, sh we should be doing. So I think that's the one thing vendors should do more of is um, mm -hmm. be very willing to admit this is what the product's weaknesses are. This is what we're really good at. And, um, you know, we'll take it under advisement and influence the roadmap with, where you think we should go, but that's not something that we can do right now. That's what okay. we do. And, you know, personally for you, what it is that you're looking for in a vendor? Uh, I mean, it's really around that, uh, a value proposition. Um, just thinking about some of the data broker vendors um, that I'm leveraging now, like I have to, I have to see there's value in this thing in a way that allows me to execute against my goals and objectives. So this is a thing that I need. Um, you're providing it, and you know, I think that's um, where that where that sweet spot happens. Um, if it's if it's just sort of a shot in the dark, the products that I'm never going to use, you know, better understanding my role in in companies helps you do that too. Um, so that's 
that's what I need more than anything else is, is you know, awareness of what I need and what I can do and uh, how we can leverage that. Thank you. Yeah, speaking a bit about the industry, uh, are there any specific uh, individuals that are that have been most influential to you that you wanted to name drop here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'd be very remiss not to mention Jack Jones. I mean, he's really influenced me um, to love uh, risk management broadly, and he gave me the opportunity to you know co-author books with him, which was really influential to me. Um, but there's others too. Uh, you know, I, I think um, my first um, pure security job uh, was uh, due to a friend of mine in Columbus, Ohio named Clark Cummings. Uh, he, you know, took a chance on me and I really appreciated that. And we did some really great things together. He, you know, got me into the uh, lots of different organizations like the ISSA and really sort of, you know, under, helped me understand better around what security consulting looked like and you know, how to provide value that way. So I always, I always think fondly of him too. Okay, thank you for that. Um... Before I let you go, what's the best way to uh, get connected with you? Uh, yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the best way. Um, I, I talk to a lot of people on that all the time. Um, that's probably the best way. I don't, I don't do much on Twitter. I'm sort of a, a lurker on Twitter, but <laughs> LinkedIn, I, I, I have a lot of really good conversations with people one-on-one -on, -one on there that usually shift to something like Zoom or, e or, or email after a while. So, yeah, I think that's the way to get it. Okay, LinkedIn it is. And one final question, if money was never an issue, what would you do with your life? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that I need something to do. Um, so I'm not, but I'm also very fortunate that, you know, I'm not doing this job uh, because I need money. I'm doing this job because I like what I do. It kind of works both ways, I guess. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think about this a lot, you know, we just had this giant lottery here in the U.S. and we sort of <laughs> got a little bit of daydreams around, gee, what would I do? Um, you know, I like the idea of uh, uh, helping nonprofits, helping people in the industry learn about cybersecurity. I don't think I'd quit my day job because I love what I do so much. So I'd, I'd, I'd have to supplement it with these other things around, you know, um, you know being um, a venture startup, uh, you know, kind of person, uh, you know, uh, helping fund the companies that need seed money for stuff like that. That's, that's you know, that's sort of a, a daydream I sometimes think about. Okay, thank you for that. And with that, Jack, uh, it's all, I mean, do you have any summarizing notes before I let you go? Yeah, no, just uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, having me today. I really enjoyed this and uh, it was a really good conversation. And uh, you know, I look forward to um, you know, your audience's reaction to some of my thoughts. And I hope that's, that's valuable to them. And if they have any follow-ups or questions, you know, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk to them. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. And I couldn't have said it better. Uh, I'm sure your insight would resonate with some of our listeners and looking forward to having uh, that follow up uh, conversation with you, Jack, specifically about risk management quantification. See you soon in the future. Thank you.